my name is Austin Wong. I'm the class of 68, and I'm fine with he, him. Uh, and uh, I've been a resident of Las Vegas for about eight years now, and I enjoy it here. Uh, I gotta say, I, I didn't move here for the most altruistic of reasons, but I really have enjoyed living here, and uh, I think I'm most involved right now in uh, local politics. Well, again, I guess it's my interest in politics, and right now I'm just, uh, my wife warns me for talking too much about this. We, we live in, in a uh, kind of, a, in kind of a isolated community, we're in a gated community, it's relatively safe, but it's mainly conservative, and I haven't, it's not been too bad. I haven't, say, encountered uh, Asian hate and that kind of thing in my community. But I have encountered uh, a lot of vitriol on some of my milder statements, and I, I just—it's incomprehensible to me why that would be. And, and I just—I just have to be careful with what I say because I'll get attacked for it. And one of the things I said is my using my, my medical background. I, early on, I was just urging everybody to wear masks and get vaccinated as soon as you could. Okay. And then I got, and I sent it out to the to members of the Progressive Club. Well, the word got out, and someone, I had phrased the statements that, uh, please uh, get vaccinated regardless of what your reluctant neighbors may do. And I got attacked for that. I said, why? Because they said, well, you know, you're, you're accusing Republicans of being reluctant to get vaccinated. I said, I didn't even say that. I didn't even allege it. Yet yeah, it turns out it's true that for whatever reasons, uh, more Republicans are hesitant to get vaccinated than. Uh, Democrats or independents. And that just seems incomprehensible to me why that is. So that's disturbing. So I, I really feel that our, our democracy is actually under siege by the thinking that the Trump, the Trump supporters. The, uh, I mean, the, the reports are that the Republican base is, is largely still supportive of Trump and his big lie. And it just uh, is incomprehensible to, uh, I think, anybody that's got a an open mind, so that bothers me a lot. And I think, uh, you know, at the very least, we need to do something about it. I, I don't, you know, if I, if I say anything like Trump should be equated with uh, uh, fascism, that's that's wrong. But he is very autocratic and, and really feels like uh, he should be controlling things, and he's the only one that can save us and that kind of thing. Which is so. I, th I think that's kind of really dangerous thinking. And. Uh, well, so that that bothers me. The other the reason I, some of the reasons I moved out here is because of, uh, frankly, because of the low taxes in Las Vegas, and I regret that now because the taxes where I lived in Cincinnati before we lived in a nice community called Madera. We had great schools because it was so heavily supported by property taxes. Cincinnati schools were terrible because they weren't supported by property taxes, or they were, and they had no one. You know, they were in the wrong areas though. But anyway. So here, this Nevada, Nevada is really lagging in, in public school education, and one of the big reasons is because of lack of funding. You, know, you, can, you know, the, my Republican friends, if they still are my friends, say you just can't just throw money at them. Well, that's not just the issue. You do need to support them, but the, but it's not just they do need money too. So that that is, is an issue and. Uh, uh, I wish we could raise property taxes here. I, I mean, we benefit from it, but we certainly in my community, the gated community, we can all afford to pay more taxes, and we probably should to support. It. I have no kids or grandkids here, but I think the the secret of success for any community is, is public schools, public education. It's for the it's for the community, for, for the for the present, and certainly for the future. And one of the things that. Uh, uh, Nevada and certainly Las Vegas is really suffering from is a lack of a diversified economy. And that, that comes, goes back partly because for a long-term solution you really need to have strong education. And to, so I'm really hopeful that uh, President Biden's plan for human infrastructure goes through. I think that's going to be really important because it's not just for, you know, if we're part of the community we should be just thinking of the, of the future too, not just of the present. I don't think I made the wisest choices. Even at Williams, I don't think I made the wisest choices because I've seen, read some other interviews. I've had some great ones too. I've, I just recently read one 
with uh, my former classmate, uh, Clint Wilkins, and he's, he's been a great educator. And what he and Mike Hurley, he said, they're great educators. They said, when they were at Williams, they did not think they took all the advantages, the educational opportunities there were. And that's certainly the case with me. I think I did learn some things, though, some of them uh, somewhat painfully, that uh, I wasn't really concentrating on the right things. I was concentrating on trivia. And I wasn't paying as enough attention to my studies as I should have. But later in my, my junior and senior year, I did better in that. So I was pleased that I was able to turn that around a little bit. But not as well as, as I would have liked, but still not bad. And I made a lot of bad career decisions. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to have to have been gone into medicine and, and radiology because I do like the intellectual aspects of it. And it's really is challenging. And when I've done well, it's been it's been very satisfying. And if you but of course, the problem part of it is that uh, when you're in a field like that, uh, there is no one that's perfect. And when you make a mistake, it can have bad effects on people. And I've made a, made a few of those, and I admit them, but uh, you always feel bad about that. It's like, why did I make a mistake like that? Which, you know, I'm, I'm, at least I wasn't a surgeon and literally kill someone, but I've made some mistakes that certainly affected people's lives. And I regret, I, I wish I could take some of those back. But, uh, but overall, I think I've uh, been okay with it. Um, so being in, being in medicine is satisfying. I've always been um, altruistic. And I think the nice thing about medicine, I guess, you know, without being boastful about it, is that in general, I think people in medicine are altruistic and they, want, they do want to help people. And it's not just about making money. So making money, of course, is, you know, is, is, a, is a necessity and having some certain amount of disposable income is, is, is helpful because I can donate to charities and do things like that. No, it's hard to just put it that way. Um, I, I, we, we, I certainly had some great professors and I think it's really amusing because uh, I, I was a little disappointed in not going to a top medical school, I went to a middle tier medical school. But my education was still okay there, but I, I certainly had a, a top-rate education at Williams, and some of the professors there were excellent. I was a biology major like most pre-meds were, but most pre-meds were science majors, but they've come from other professions, other disciplines too. So they, they, and the professors really are, have been great teachers. My, my professor, Professor Grant, was, uh, was really good. He's my mentor. Um, but the one who has gotten probably the most accolades from, Probably rightfully so was Professor, Professor Matthews, who taught him an excellent uh, biology class. He just uh, he could talk really. He, but one of my <clears throat> he was a year or so ahead of me at Williams, and then he was, went to the same medical school in Cincinnati. Uh, Marty Samuels. Marty Samuels would said that uh, Sam Matthews could uh, teach at any medical school in the country and be one of the top people, and that was true. He was, you know, the Cincinnati, we had some good professors, but some mediocre ones, and uh, he was absolutely right, because uh, uh, Dr. Matthews could have been a top professor at, at, at a, any medical school, because he really knew his stuff, and he really taught it well. So, and Marty Samuels really went on to have quite a career in, in medicine. He was, uh, went into neurology, he was a professor of neurology, I don't know if sure he still is, but one of the top people in neurology in the country at Harvard. Well, I, I suppose uh, doing any job I undertake, uh, doing it and doing it well, and getting some things accomplished, sometimes just little things. And so, you know, I've, if you're down in a rut sometimes, uh, I, I think if you set yourself some simple chores that you think you can achieve easily, or you can achieve, and then accomplishing those will at least bring a small measure of satisfaction. So I, I, I occasionally I've uh, done that. Um, my hobby has always been somewhat like uh, gamesmanship and stuff like that. I, I like, I used to like to play chess. I like to play recreational poker. But the realization of something like in poker is that um, I'm never going to be great. And there are two levels of poker. One is limit poker and no limit poker. No limit is such a totally different game. It's the same game, but it's so, so different because there's so much more skill involved in no limit because the, the bluffing element, knowing when to when to play them aggressively, when to be passive, and when to fall. It, it's just so different. Um, 
So, but so there's such a huge element of luck in, 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 the, in the limit poker. And the problem is you could be excellent in it and still wind up losing. And not just losing for a short period of time, but just losing for long stretches because the, the element of luck is really predominant. So it's maybe 20% skill and 80% luck. So it's just like you can have a bad streak for weeks and months and you're playing great. You're doing everything right, but you just keep on losing no matter what you have you'll get beaten, you know, and it's just, that's just luck. There's nothing you can do about that. So that is frustrating. But if you really stick with it and you have to be really patient with it, then after months and months and months of losing, you can start winning again and you will still be a long-term favorite. So if you play it over a period of, it has to be over years, maybe maybe even decades, you'll be a winner if you if you do all the right odds. Knowing, but I, I'm not, I don't have that kind of patience, I don't have that kind of knowledge. Because you actually have to know a lot about statistics and math and what the odds are and playing it just right. And even then you can be, you, know, you go by a hunch. But even then, the luck element is so big, it's not, it's not going to equalize, you know, you can, you know, you, you're flipping a coin, you know in the long run it's going to come out 50-50. But you can have a stretch of, a long stretch of being all tails or all heads and there's nothing you can do about that. Well, I can think of two people. One, I could think of my high school math teacher who was really inspiring, who really made, really uh, rewarded you for doing your homework. And yeah, other places, you know, you did your homework and the teacher said, nah, you know, they just went, frankly went through your stuff and checked, checked the marks off and all that. But th this teacher really went through it. If you made a mistake, he really corrected it and told you what was wrong and how to correct it and all that. So that he, he was really a, a, an excellent teacher in, in doing that. It's really, uh, so it, it really motivated you to, to do your homework and do it well and being careful about that. So that's one. The other, I gotta say, is probably like uh, President Obama and Michelle Obama, what they've, done, what they've done for the country. They weren't able to accomplish everything they wanted to do, but they, they accomplished a lot. And they really were an inspiration to many people. So there, there are so many great people. I, mean, I wish I could say, you know, I'm not a religious person. I did go to church for a while, but, uh, and I think they've done some good things, but I'm not that way. I wish I could, you know, say, I love Mother Teresa, you know, and Pope and all that, but, you know, that wouldn't be true. Yeah, but, you know, Matt Teacher and the Obamas are pretty, pretty good people to, to say thank you for, or thank you to. Um, I mean, I, I know that, you know, that the high school relationship with teachers can be super meaningful for something like inspiring that love of education, really teaching people, you know, how to interact, how to educate themselves, and they develop that, that rapport. Um, so I'm sure your teacher would be very happy to hear that, and the Obamas, I'm sure, would also be very thankful to have, uh, feel that it, their impact is meaningful. Um, so that rounds out the formal questions. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to share with anyone who watches the world listens to this? Hmm, that's really a very, very good question. Well, I think that uh, people that have gone to Williams should be, uh, you know, realize that they've, they've been privileged, they've had a, uh, if they spent any time listening at all, they've, they've had a fine education and, uh, you know, they have a lot of opportunities. Uh, and wherever they are in their career, in life, they can uh, still, make meaningful contributions.